So welcome to um, month 11 of the Contact Centre Network. Uh, we're going to be covering off um, a few things today around um, complaints and FCR. But what I wanted to do before we, uh, we launch into the agenda, just drop into the chat what is your biggest challenge when it comes to managing complaints and first call resolution at the moment and anything that you think might be topical uh, for today's session. Because what we'll do is we'll use some of the stuff that goes into the chat um, when we get to the, the Q&A panel uh, discussion and we've got some questions that we've um, prepared in advance but we've also got some great questions from um, the virtual audience and as, as ever we'll always engage as we go through so if there's any questions drop them into the chat but curious to know what some of your biggest challenges are when it comes to managing complaints and first call resolution um, so we, we're, we've got an hour today we're, we're going to run this till 2pm uh, so we'll try and make sure we finish on time opportunity at the moment now Given that there's people on here that you probably don't know, uh, make some introductions, um, share your your links to uh, your, your LinkedIn profiles uh, and get to know people. Um, please, though, I do ask, please do not try and sell to anybody on the call. That would be great. Thanks very much. Um, so we've got some uh, few, few things to go through in terms of the agenda for today. We talk on these calls about all things customer experience. Uh, and we talk about leadership, we talk about people, process, and technology. And one of the big things that impacts our people is their ability and their competence around handling customer complaints. And that has a massive impact on customer experience. So we're going to be focusing today on the, the, the people side of the quadrant and some of the, um, maybe the technology and some of the data that we can look at when we look at yeah, first call resolution. Um, but we've got two great guests for today. So please welcome my uh, guests, which are Caroline Wells and Alan Milne. Um, they're going to introduce themselves and they'll give you a little bit of their, their history and their experience. And then we've, we've got uh, around a 15, 20 minute slot for each of those to, to share some of their thoughts, some of their reflections on how we can develop and manage strategies for complaints and how we can start to improve and increase our opportunity to do first call resolution. Um, and then we'll, once, we, once we've heard from both Caroline and Alan, we'll then break into a, a Q&A panel discussion but if you've got any questions as we go through and as you're listening to anything that the speakers um, are saying and you find it particularly interesting, drop it into the chat um, and I can try and fire some questions at them at the right opportune moment. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm going to invite Caroline um, onto the stage. Uh, introduce yourself and over to you. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, Oh, look, I've come up as money advice training. That's not right. I work with them. Well, I can tell you a bit about that anyway. So hello, everyone. I'm Caroline. It's lovely to meet you all. Um, it's so refreshing to see so many people not from financial services um, uh, <laughs> because um, I think the concept of complaints and how we can resolve them as quickly as possible is something that um, exists obviously across many different sectors and I'm really pleased to be involved in this because some of my background has been um, customer service, customer experience really ever since I've left school. Um, started off medically as an underwriter, so doing medical underwriting for life assurance essentially because I loved reading people's stories. I was very kind of hooked into that and I think that's the kind of key theme that stayed with me because and I sort of I do it a bit of a disservice when I say that I ended up with complaints. And I don't know how it happened. I do. I applied for it. So it's my fault that I ended up doing it. But I wasn't really quite sort of sure at the time as to why I'd really wanted to go into it. And it is to do with problem solving and talking to people and understanding what makes people tick. That definitely hasn't disappeared. That's certainly something that for me um, stays with me. And, and the reason why that I'm still in the job and what I'm doing today is, is simply because of that. I um, I worked at the Financial Ombudsman Service for almost 20 odd years up until 2017. And before that, I was at a predecessor Ombudsman scheme that um, was subsumed into the Financial Ombudsman Service and worked my way up through there. And since leaving, I've taken that knowledge and also I'd started to get quite heavily into responding to the needs of consumers who were who were vulnerable as we now know them to be and were really struggling with processes and explaining what had gone wrong and being able to articulate the problem 
and their challenging behaviour as well, which was kind of the thing that was presented to a lot of colleagues and didn't know how to deal with it. And off the back of that, I now do work across industry around complaints handling, consumer vulnerability, everything from the police to utilities, the energy sector, comms, and of course, financial services, because that's kind of where people know me from. So that's my my history and my background and why I'm really, so you know, sometimes you get invited to speak at things and you sort of say to people that you're really looking forward to it and you're not always, to be honest. Actually, this is one of those ones where genuinely, I was gonna, I thought this is gonna be a really interesting conversation to have, particularly around the subject of complaints and to trying to resolve them. Thank you, thank you very much. So um, just in terms of kind of a little bit about the, like what's going on at the moment around consumers and behaviours and also what's happening at places like the Ombudsman Service and beyond that as well that will affect all of us. I was very keen actually that I can give you some um, sort of insight as to what's going on, not just in financial services, but where it's affecting other parts of the industry as well, because it, there's definitely this sort of trickle ripple effect that happens to the rest of us when we start to see some things happening in different um, different sectors. Certainly the, um, the Ombudsman Service in particular, and particularly around financial services complaints, a lot of change going on there, but actually what they've been seeing is an increase in the number of cases that are being um, sent to them because of the actions of firms as a result of COVID. So this is the firm's response to people who were perhaps were struggling and needed some support and help or not being available to be able to provide people with the support and help when they needed it at that time. They're also seeing an increase in complaints from people who are, I suppose, getting a little bit sick and tired of service limitations as a result of COVID, because of COVID. So we know that there was kind of this lovely honeymoon period at the beginning of all of this, where, where people cut us a bit of slack, essentially, in the service industry, because they knew we were trying to get ourselves sorted out. We're now in that sort of stage where people's tolerance levels are starting to um, dip quite a bit. And the things that they would have forgiven us for in the past, like, and, and I don't miss, mean to kind of like underplay it but you know the silly little mistakes that we can make um the little irritations that in the past people might have let go by actually people aren't doing that anymore they're pulling us up on it more than they have done before and although they are you know in the scheme of somebody you know experiencing some you know terrible harm that causes thousands of pounds worth of of, of damage to them um, financially or otherwise these small things don't tend to have a lot of value to them but when you get enough of them people lose their rag <laughs> in the end and want to do something about it because the first time that you'll probably get to hear about that is when they make the call to speak to somebody about it because it's the straw that, that's broken the camel's back now there's something else going on there too which is that um it's not always just our fault really because these things are happening all over the place there are people's experiences of different organizations different businesses different sectors um, you only need a few of these little irritants these small things to go wrong in kind of different aspects of your life that in the end you've had enough and unfortunately I always say it's the poor person that's kind of last in the queue that will get it for everything that everybody else has done beforehand so sometimes um, the response and the reaction that we're seeing from consumers now is actually um, a lot bigger than it has been before, because what we're seeing is a manifestation of, of all of their frustrations about everyone. But we're getting it because we're the last one in the queue. So a you know, big difference in consumer behaviour as well. The other thing that's happening at the Ombudsman Service, just generally, for those of you that are interested in financial services in particular, is that, of course, they've seen things like payment protection insurance complaints start to go down now. So what they are getting um, tends to be more complex in nature and more highly individualised. So there isn't that kind of you know, lovely economy of scale or it's the same product over and over again. So you can you know, batch things up into spreadsheets and do all that sort of lovely stuff from an operational perspective. It's all becoming sort of highly individualised. And that does make a big difference. Um, there's also something else which is going on as well, which is about um, 
where consumers just don't feel like something sounds right or it doesn't feel fair, that's also a bit of a catalyst for people for, to complain. And that's probably the area that I've seen um, crop up the most in a call centre environment where people are passing on like the message of the business, you know, the process is this, I can't change it. And so people are getting quite frustrated about that. And that's where we start to see those sorts of um, interactions and uh, complaints arising off the back of that sort of, that doesn't feel right to me, doesn't feel fair, or I've been given the runaround. So I'm having to speak to a few people before I get either the answer that I was looking for um, or the answer that I need or just an answer would be nice. So that sort of um, background is really starting to have an impact on the type of consumer behaviour that we're starting to see and their, their readiness, if you like, to pick us up on stuff when we're not doing it in the way that they expect and to escalate it more quickly than they have done before because of sort of lower tolerance levels. So um, I suppose the kind of like million dollar question is how do you stop that sort of stuff from happening? <laughs> Wouldn't it be lovely? If I knew the answers to all of these things, I'd be sat on a, on a yacht somewhere in Jamaica or Barbados, something myself now. But um, I suppose the most obvious one I would say is, and, and this is obviously stating the blooming obvious, but it's about not letting these things happen which is easier said than done. And I think the fact that we're talking about um, resolution at its earliest possible time is really a good conversation to be having, particularly around this point of trying to prevent these things from happening. And that relies on good root cause analysis, which can come a lot from the insight that we get from the calls that we're having with our customers. And also, um, do you know what? The other thing is, is if things do go wrong and they will go wrong because we're all human, um, we are proactive about it and we do something so that our customers don't have to tell us that we've got it wrong. Um, that's really important. And that particularly in terms of changing consumer expectation at the moment, there is this, and I think it's, it's, it's not unreasonable for people to expect that if something goes wrong, the business is kind of keeping an eye on that and wants to be able to nip it in the bud so that the customer doesn't have to make all the effort and I'm sure when we get to the questions later on we can talk about sort of um, SCR in more in more detail and some um, examples that well so just a personal sort of like example that I've got that I wanted to share with everyone as well which is kind of like a classic example of, of where it can go wrong and you know if we are still in that reactionary phase so we couldn't spot it we didn't know we had to do anything about it and the first time we hear about it is when we're on the call is obviously having people that you know have all the skills that we talk about empathy, emotional intelligence, time is really important. Just having the time to talk to people and not feeling that you're being rushed off the call um, makes a huge difference to individuals when they're trying to talk about something that's important to them. And um, dealing with it in the right way. And there's a huge focus now from the financial services regulator about reaching right customer outcomes. So coming away from um, doing what's technically right or doing what's right to fit the rules to doing what's right to get the right outcome for the customer and I think that's a really interesting dynamic when we start to think about um, FCR and how that's going to work in kind of like this this new world order that, that's coming around the corner at the moment and of course we can learn from regulation as, as part of that if you're in financial services you'll know that there's a lot of information coming out from the FCA more than probably they've ever sent out um, and there's a real shift change and a real change in tone from them about what they're expecting from us. Um, the rules on how to handle complaints that many of us are familiar with actually derive from, from the FCA rules. And unfortunately, I've been around long enough to have been at the predecessor scheme where these rules were first brought in. So in actual fact, DISP, which are the complaint handling rules that financial services firms have to follow, they're probably about 35 years old now. So before internet, before social media, before some of the products that we had as well. Um, and I'm really, I'm, I'm not from a customer experience perspective actually, because customer experience wasn't even something that we were talking about back then. 
And I'm, I'm really curious if we all sat down and rewrote those complaint handling rules now, would we do it differently because of what we know about what works and what doesn't? The reason why I say that is because I, I happily say to people, you know, financial services um, cops a lot of um, flack for what it's done in the past and some of it's deserved and some of it isn't. But one of the things that did come out of it, which was really handy, was a, this is kind of like framework around handling complaints, which a lot of other industries have adopted for themselves. And so even if you're not in financial services, it's worth keeping a check on what's going on and what's coming out of the FCA, because that will start to filter through to other areas of the industry. Um, and to other sectors uh, within different industries as well, because they tend to kind of beg, borrow and steal all the good ideas from each other. And actually, that's not a bad thing, because it means there's consistency of approach when customers go to a different organisation that's under a different sector. They have a very similar thing. So there's some of this stuff going on as well. And I always say like the, um, the complaint handling rules are, as I see them, a bit of a jumping off point, really. Um, if you based your handling of a customer complaint on those rules alone, they probably wouldn't get a very good customer experience now, if I'm honest. If you use them as your base and you adopt them and adapt them and do more than them, actually you're going to be on to more of a winning streak because you're doing more than what you need to. And actually that's the right thing to do for today's customer because of the age of these rules that we're all working to. And there's something else as well that actually this applies to all of us who might be covered by any form of um, alternative dispute resolution scheme is that the government brought out a consultation in summer of this year. Um, massive document, about 160 odd pages long. I don't know if anybody used it as bedtime reading or to prop up a wobbly table, but actually I had to read it. And um, a lot of it was interesting, some of it not so, but what caught my eye was the recommendation that access to ADR schemes is made easier for consumers and that as part of that the amount of time that we as businesses have to respond to complaints is reduced from eight weeks which is something that many of us are familiar with down to four that would be sector wide across different industries as well um, and that's that's recognizing the different type of consumer that we have today and their expectations around how quickly complaints should be dealt with and the types of products that we've got now compared to what we had sort of 30 odd years ago and how much easier it is for us to apply for stuff like in minutes now to get a loan and so the expectation sometimes is that we're able to turn things around that quickly when it comes to things that have gone wrong for people so that's another thing to look out for as well and then finally um the fca have brought out a proposal about something called the consumer duty. Uh, the the current thinking at the moment is that the consumer duty is going to is going to be an additional principle that firms have to abide by. It may replace what we have known in the past to be treating customers fairly or the fair treatment of customers, whichever way around you want to say it, but both of them. And for me, there were two areas. So there's kind of like four areas that the regulator has asked us to focus on, but there are two, I think, in particular that are very relatable to complaints and to, to call centres. The first one is around customer service and the second one is around communications. Now, on customer service, the, the message that's, very, that's coming out very loud and clear at the moment from the regulator is that we need to know our customers so know who our customers actually are, and then design our service proposition to meet our customers' needs, and not to design our customer proposition first, and then hope our customers can fit, and then we have to keep moulding them like around it and bringing new things in. So big change there and real evidence now being wanted from the FCA for financial services firms, that's gonna happen. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that sort of view is adopted by other types of um, regulators or in different industries as well and the last one is about communications which is about maximizing every contact point and communication that we have with our customers and the most important thing about that was the expectation that we now check to make sure it's done what it's supposed to as well which we've never had that sort of um, scrutiny placed on what we send out to customers 
it's like if you if you give a customer a call to action did it work if it didn't work then you've got to change it in real time so that those customers that haven't taken up the action that you wanted them to actually get the chance to do it because you've tweaked your communication to them and i think they're two very important kind of sea changes in the way that we provide and present our services to customers both when things go wrong but also in terms of like general customer service when people phone up to chat to us about anything in particular or um, if they've got a, a problem and they need to talk to somebody that can help them sort it out and that's the, the kind of pivotal point when we can do something about it and we know we know how we know how important it is to give a good first impression. I'm not saying anything that's new to anybody else, but actually I think more so both from a, a customer experience perspective, but also from a regulatory compliance perspective that we're able to show an evidence that we're, we're doing that in the right way. So that's my update from me. I wanted to kind of like try and keep it as, um, as brief as possible, but try and give you a, a taster for everything that's going on at the moment which will affect all of us in some ways. And I think there's, there's two key things that um, have jumped out for me there, uh, Caroline, that I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions on. And if mm. anybody does have any questions for Caroline, now is a great opportunity to drop those into the um, into the chat. But there was two things that I, I wanted to ask. One was around the, um, you, you talked a great deal about digital transformation and the access that customers have got to complain in different mediums yeah. now and obviously i mean we've got uh, karen on the line from live chat and i think digital online complaints are in some respects or can be perceived to be less important than somebody who picks up the phone and complains mm. so what would your advice or your strategy be for handling complaints in those different mediums um it's, it's, and it's a really good question, actually. Thank you for that. It's sorry, it's, one, it's not one that I pre prepared you for. No, either, no, so it's like, <laughs> no, that's all right. Just see my face, I'm like, Bleh. no, no, it's <laughs> fine. Um, so, we've got, we, what we've seen in the past is that we've started off traditionally, people used to write in, then it became email, what have you, and we sort of adapted from that. Then we got Twitter, Facebook, other social media, WhatsApp as well. And um, often I've seen that businesses, uh, look after those in different areas of the business. So there isn't necessarily a cohesive joined up approach to how you would respond to those types of complaints. So I think that's my first recommendation is that irrespective of what the channel is that you're using, you need to have that um, joined up approach within the business so that everyone knows what they're doing. Um, obviously an omni-channel approach would be brilliant if you could do it so that irrespective of what channel people hop across from, you have that that timeline if you like of what customers are doing so you know what works for them what doesn't and also what their preferred uh, channel is depending on the type of interaction they're having with you as well because that's something that we learn as we go we don't we think we might know and I mean this from a consumer's perspective if you ask me what I prefer I'll say email when it comes to hearing from a business what they think about my complaint I actually don't like it by email because I think that looks a little bit cheap you know so i want it i want it in something that looks good um but i don't you know i realize that other people don't do that so i think making sure that you're joined up and also that people don't get a different experience just because they use a different channel so you know it shouldn't be quicker to have a response from one set one channel than it is from the other you have to make sure that each area is resourced accordingly so people get acknowledge acknowledgements in time and that people don't jump cues and you're able to work out how to take people out of certain channels because actually that's not their preferred method it's just the method they thought they'd get the most traction from so mirroring doesn't always work i think there's sort of some really good points i think that whole cohesive strategy make it personalized omni-channel mm. where you can mm. and same experience regardless of channel is something that i, I picked up on there the other yeah. one that i i had and I think what we what we can be guilty of sometimes with complaints and complaint management is having very reactive strategies to it. Um, so one of the things I, I kind of like to, to think about is if you think about your complaints, what is a good proactive complaint strategy for, for contact centres or for, for businesses that you've seen that can almost help invite those complaints rather than reacting to those complaints and get ahead of the curve? 
so so the the kind of ultimate that I've seen is where um, if something goes wrong kind of in the in back office for example that the people that are on the front line or the people that are in the complaints team are included in the conversations about that and they're included in the solution that's found to deal with it so you you head it off at the pass essentially and become proactive which is the biggest difference as opposed to um the kind of flip side of it which can be something's gone wrong brace yourself we're going to get a load of complaints yeah. and it's like well actually you could involve people earlier than that to be able to proactively contact people because to be honest half of the half of the frustration that, that that can be felt by by customers is actually having to make the call in the first place yeah. um you know and you want you want businesses to kind of be on it all the time yeah. and i think there's an expectation that there's somebody sitting there with like 15 massive screens checking everything coming in and going out and making sure it's all working so i think i think that's the biggest thing for me is is complaints shouldn't just be about reacting to stuff that's gone wrong and being kind of set up on that basis it's about what can those team of people who have the skills to have really good conversations with customers yeah. Um, and frontline colleagues, how can they be used to to have those conversations with customers before the customer sometimes even realizes that something's gone wrong and not be afraid to do that? Yeah. And I, I think there's some really great ways that I've seen over over my time working in the, the contact center industry. And I think great ones that help head things off at the pass is, is, is the phrase you used earlier is to say, right, mm. really proactive welcome calls proactive closed loop calling of customer feedback yeah pre-renewal discussions when you're coming up to an account renewal any problems that they had and try yep. and iron some of those things out um that have that that history of that customer contact and i think that works really really well yeah. in and, getting and also, yeah and, and also just being um just being really open about wanting to hear from people and not being afraid to use the word complaint yeah. also in things like your web pages and not them not being hidden right at the bottom and you're having to click like three pages on to get to where you need to because and also just you know some of the really basic stuff like how you present your contact us page and the way that you set out the different communication methods that you you um you have on offer for people to contact you actually quite a lot of the time what we do in businesses is we probably put our preferred one first which doesn't necessarily match what our customer's preferred method is. And that can come across as being a bit um, barrier inducing. So, so thinking also about the, the impression that we're giving in the words that we're using, the openness and the, like, we're, bit, we're quite comfortable. If we get stuff wrong, tell us. It's not a dirty word. Like, we can use the C word. And we're quite happy to. Um, but make it easy for people to get in contact. Because if they don't, then they'll, their behaviour and, will leak out into other ways like social media and all the things that we know not to be very helpful. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Caroline. I You're think welcome. Um, and, and thinking about all the things that you've just said, I think there's, there's a real correlation between complaint management and um, first call resolution. And I think we, we were chatting in our, in our pre-call, Alan, um, around kind of some of, the, um, some of the things that we can do to empower uh, teams and empower people and empower our customers to help generate an improvement in first call resolution. So I'm going to welcome you into the fold, um, Alan. So in introduce yourself, your, your experience, and um, how we, how can we help improve first call resolution rates is the, is the topic. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a point where I realise it's not very good going second. Because <laughs> um, that was uh, that was very insightful and um, and probably uh, a bit more than I'm going to give you. Uh, so I'm Alan Milne. I have got a 20 years exec director experience in financial services, in retail financial services. I've worked for a, a number of organisations that are predominantly retailers, but have their own financial services business, um, which is where um, they make most of their money. Um, I've done four years consultancy, um, working with a number of organisations, uh, two of which are FTSE 100s, uh, one a bank, one a retailer, and uh, I am also involved in a lending startup, 
uh, which is going through FCA authorization. I do some work with a compliance consultancy and I'm about to join the board of, uh, of, of what's a comparison website, but actually has uh, almost a thousand um, introducer appointed reps. So therefore it's, it's a brokerage as well. So um, as you can gather from that, all my experience is in the financial services arena. Um, but when it comes to complaints, that's not a bad thing. Um, I know Caroline has said that the, um, that the, the, the DISP is based upon stuff that's 35 years old. Um, having said that, it's still a good framework. It might not be perfect, but um, having, having worked very closely um, with the FCA on a number of occasions, um, I have worked for a couple of organizations that have had um, historic PPI, um, PPI remediation exercises. Uh, I've sat in the naughty step at the FCA and been under close supervision uh, through to having to sign an attestation uh, in order to complete something that I said I would do. So I, I have gone through different phases of this and I think very clearly the FCA is a good model because what they want is what's best for the customer. And while it might seem bureaucratic as a lender sometimes, I think it's very, very important not to lose sight of the fact that they're the good guys and that they are looking for outcomes for consumers that are fitting with what they should be expecting in, um, in situations and organizations should be looking out for them. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of complaints, um, I wrote down a number of things because um, Caroline said some of the things I was going to say, so I finished up uh, scribbling away and, you know, I think, I think complaints should be channel agnostic. Uh, I think different people use different channels at different times and that might depend on what their other priorities are, how important something is and, you know, how they how they view the organization. And the FCA is quite good. One of the good things about it is it's very much evidence driven. So I am more likely as a consumer to, if I'm, if I'm dealing with a financial services organization, I'm more likely to put something in writing. That doesn't mean my complaint is any less important than if I was going to phone, but I know that it's much easier. Um, it's much easier for me to have a record. Yeah, they might record the call, but I don't. It's much easier for me to keep a record of something that I communicate through email or, in fact, I would never write to anybody because that's a bit, <laughs> it takes far Very too long. Very a pigeon these days. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think really that would be, that would be the one thing I would, I would, I would certainly add to what Caroline said is about, is about, is about making sure that you understand what it is that's driving the client. So it's all about, it's about identification. Um, you know, complaints take, take time. Uh, again, Caroline said that, you know, systems, digital systems are quite quick. The happy path is quick. When you go off that, it becomes much more, much less automated, much more um, judgmental in some cases. It's about then getting the right answer. I think the, one of the words that I would, I would say, you know, if, if I was in the front line, what I would really want to do is I'd want to diffuse the problem. That's the first thing I would do. I'd want to try and take the heat out of it. And it's much easier to take the heat out of it if it's a, if it's a voice call. Because you can make the right noises, you can, you, you know, you can train people to, to, to be sympathetic and to have the right attitude. It's much harder when it comes to writing because sometimes, and if you've got chat or anything, sometimes if they're, if they're dealing with multiple um, multiple customers at the same time, it's quite, it's quite difficult to keep the tone right. Uh, and therefore, I think that's much, much harder. But, but, you know, I would say definitely diffuse it. I think one of the things that's really key is the identification of them. And we've, we've talked about complaints. The FCA talk about uh, expressions of dissatisfaction, which is, is probably slightly wider. And it means that regulated organizations need to capture probably a bit more than, than some who are not regulated. Um, I think, 
I, I, my, my background is, is originally is credit risk. So I did operations, I did credit risk. And, and therefore, I tend to look at things in quite a numeric way. And, you know, complaints are expensive. And therefore, the resolution of them, the quicker you resolve them, the cheaper it is. Um, Caroline spent 20 years at FOS. So it was 20 years, maybe I've mis misheard that. Um, I look at what organisations are paying FOS. Because FOS is not, FOS as, as being the, the backdrop of, you know, the backstop for financial services. Um, it's been £650 a case, it's going up to £750 a case. Um, if you look at where the banks are at the moment, um, NatWest have currently got 128,683 open cases. That's not counting the ones that they've already paid for. That's the ones that are still out there at that kind of level of, 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 um, of cost. And you look, at, you look at where your complaint takes you in terms of, of, the, of the bottom line. And I think you know, what you need to do is you need to resolve them quickly. That involves empowerment. You need to empower the advisors or the, the, the people who are dealing with the complaints. They need to know um, what they can do to resolve the complaint. Because in order to resolve it quickly, you, you, you often will have to give something back to the customer. So they need to know what it is they can do. They need to know what it is. Um, you know, um, Caroline talked about, um, about the, the um, the, the need for people to know what's going on. Because if, if people know what to look for, they'll know they've got a much greater chance of actually picking it up and, and, and fixing it and recognising what the problem is. So communication is really key. Um, identification of, the, of, of when it is a complaint and when somebody uh, looking at the language that's being used and there are tools um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in, in analytical tools. Um, you know, for a large organization, they should be using something that looks at voice analytics, I believe, uh, and something that does um, text to speech or speech to text so that there can be, again, it can pick up different channels. And, you know, I know, I, I know of a good example. I've, I've struggled with it in the past uh, with a number of providers, but I know now that the technology has improved to the extent that it, it's much more effective. And I think it's about, it's about getting that uh, identification right, understanding of what it is you're dealing with. And then, and then as part of the empowerment, you need to give people, um, you need to give people limits and you do need um, you do need to have controls in there, different level people will, will be able to type different things. But that in itself is quite difficult. Because if you say to an advisor, you can give up to £50 as compensation, uh, re, you know, regardless of what the issue is. If you say £50, how many of them go to £50? If you make that £40, how many go to £40? Yeah, again, you've got to pay empowerment and and very often you, you, you because somebody's got a limit the the complaint doesn't necessarily merit that but if you empower someone up to that level there's a pretty good chance that they're going to give that so i think that's there's, there's a, that's, that's quite a challenge around how you manage the the, the financials of that and then there's the, the measurements and how you, what, what do you measure? And, you know, we talked about FCR. FCR is great, but what does it mean? You know, how do you know um, when you've resolved the call? I had an example, and we were talking before beforehand, and I, I need to get this example out there. I had one this morning where I had a call with a distribution company. So distribution company that are delivering something that's come from abroad. Uh, we're no longer part of the EU, so therefore there are VAT problems. So we've been charged VAT from an Italian retailer, and then it's come into the country, and we've got import VAT. So I phoned the carrier, and the, the advisor there said, um, you've come through to the, the, the payment line. You've already paid um, I can help you. Here are three numbers. Things that 
they do. Uh, she suddenly got it off her desk, given it to potentially three other people who I've got to identify. So I phoned one, got the wrong one. Um, however, the advisor was very helpful and he gave me a different number from the three that I had the first time uh, to, uh, to, to speak to someone. So uh, the problem then was it was the wrong number he gave me. So I had to phone back and the advisor there put me through to the number that he said he couldn't, that he had given me that was wrong. So she put me through and uh, they then couldn't resolve it, but they put me on to HMRC who resolved it in a real first call resolution. The question is, how do you measure, because they're different parts of an organization, they're completely different functions. How do you measure who's actually resolved that? And what do you term a, a resolution? So I think it's, it's quite difficult. And, and you know, in something like that, that was something they couldn't resolve because it wasn't in their remit. Because what they'd done is they'd processed the information correctly, they'd done what they were meant to do, and they generated the charges that were linked to that. So there was no problem there from their point. But again, they needed it took it took speaking to uh, four people to resolve that. So I think that's difficult. And I think I think um, I think going back to, to F, um, FCR, what you need to do is you need to make sure that you categorize the complaints that you're handling to understand which ones are resolvable in one call. Because there's no point, if you've got complex queries um, and, you're, and, and you've got a customer who bought something from you um, 11 months ago and has now got a problem with it, you're not gonna have that information at hand and your advisor is not going to be able to resolve that. Um, and therefore there is no point including that, in my view, there's no point including that in your FCR calculations. What you need to do is you need to say which ones can be resolved and what proportion of them am I resolving? I think that's much more key. It's around the identification, the classification, um, getting to the root cause analysis of things and understanding which ones can be resolved. Um, root cause analysis is the, is, is the key to it all. So getting down to, uh, uh, Caroline was talking about that, it's about getting down to what it is that's actually causing the problem, because that's the bit that you try and fix. Um, and, you know, I, I'm also a great believer in organisations, staff having the means to fix things, because in many cases, staff members are customers as well. And if you're using a service, one of the worst things as an organization you can do is give your staff a different route from the customer. Because that becomes your, you know, they become your eyes and ears of the process problems that you're giving your customers. If they don't have that experience, you don't learn. And therefore you're, you're actually, you know, you've got, you've got a group of people who are bought into your philosophies because, um, you know, they're, they're part of your team, they're part of your culture. And they're the ones who can solve a lot of the problems in the first place. You know, what's really interesting there, um, Alan, and I've seen this in other organisations is, and it's where you're looking at complaints and, and first call resolution is to say, when, you're, when your staff and your, your colleagues become part of your customer experience and they raise a complaint and the difference is in the speed of resolution of that complaint, because it's an internal staff member that might be the, the director or it might be the, the CEO or it might be a friend of the CEO. I think that's very telling in an organization where you've got those different pathways to purchase or pathways to use, but actual pathways for resolution as well. And it becomes very different, a, a very different experience internally versus externally because of that expectation of the person that is going through it and the seniority perhaps of them in an organization. What's, what's your, your experience of that? Um, my experience is that seniority wins every time, uh, and I think that's wrong. And, and you know, you know, one, of the, one of my big bugbears of working for large organisations was if I had an IT problem, mine would get fixed before, before somebody who was actually customer facing. And that's so wrong because my, my requirement to do something is a lot less than theirs. Yeah. And, and actually the, the benefit to the organisation is much greater to fix them before they fix me. And, and I think complaints are the same. And therefore, 
yeah, I think the the benefit of being more senior is you've got more ability to fix it, or you've got you can get to the right place to fix it because you know you can go across the organisation and then down as opposed to trying to find somebody to um, you know to to know where to go. Um, I think you know, one of the things that um, I've done in the past, which I think is really important uh, from an executive perspective, is um, in, in my last uh, exec role, we, we did a deep dive and a complaint every month in the board meeting. Um, so we did a lot. You know, it, it was always something that was there on the agenda. But actually, from an FS perspective, we did a deep dive and we went right down into what we perceive to be the kind of the current topic of problem. And then we went right down to look and see what the cause was. And then we got the executive responsible for the areas that were causing the problem to, uh, to feed in. So they actually had to put their comments and uh, an action plan behind stopping it. So I think it's, you know, that, that doesn't fix everything, but it, it, it was one of the things that we were able to do to fix the hotspot. And some of them were horrendous. Um, but it was it's it's about how you get there, and you know, by keeping things as open as possible to our organisation, don't bury them away, because you get them. It's your opportunity to learn. If you can if you can remove complaints, you've got happy customers, and happy and customers happier staff. tend to and happier, staff. and happier staff. But customers tend to stay, uh, staff tend to stay, uh, but you know both of them. It, it all goes back down to cost. Because if you can resolve this, it's much cheaper to resolve it. It's much cheaper to keep a customer than it is to recruit a new one. Mm, definitely. Um, and, and therefore, you, know, you, you need to invest. And, and I think one of the things that FS has got that the, that, um, that, you know, the, the, the non-regulated sectors don't have is FOS. And the cost of not resolving a, a claim, uh, or at least a, a, a complaint of some sort, the customer's got the opportunity of going to FOS and then you get hit with a bill anyway, whether it's your fault or not. And because you've got that, you've then got the dynamics of the complaint uh, become very different because all of a sudden you've got £750 to play with in terms of compensation. Yeah. And you know, while you don't want to overdo that, what you want to do is to be effective, to retain the customer and to do it in the, with the, with the, within the finances that you can afford. But at the same time, you need to remember that you've got this potential banana skin at the end of it that means that you could get hit with another 750 pounds. And I think there was a really good question that came in the, um, in the submissions beforehand for, uh, from Paul, which was around, what are your recommendations around building a business case that helps support first call resolution at the cost of, of other metrics? And I think, You've just basically, you've, you've talked about one there that I think is really pertinent to say, right, the cost of your ombudsman complaints or the cost of your F, F, FCA fines, all those go build into that business case. But what would you say? So that's some easy, of the, the that's key easy in a regulated. That's easy in a regulated norm. It's not yeah. easy in a non-regulated. But chat. actually, the principle's the same. And I think, it, you know, it, it is a good question. And it's something that organisations, you know, in any organization, they tend to have a, they, they tend to be quite finance led. And, and actually you can turn all this round into something financial to build your business case. You know, you, you get finance on site because you can show that there's going to be some kind of reduction. Then, then you get backing for it. But I think it's, it's, it's important that, um, you know, data is really, really important. And, and you can only get that by, by getting the full picture. So you need to know what's going on in the organization in terms of where the pinch points are, where the process failures are, and, and you know, continuous improvement. Again, within FS, um, you know, one of the things that, um, that, that we, we would very regularly review processes. So we would do, um, we would effectively do many versions of what the FCA did. So we would, we would come in and we would deep dive into something and we would do a, a complete review of it. Yeah. And I think that a thematic review is, is really important because then you get to know your business and you get to know where you can take, where you can take cost out because that's what it is. You know, I know at the, at the end of the day, we need to deliver a, 
a good consumer outcome and an outcome that's fair for the consumer. But you can still turn that around into finances. Yeah. And you use the finances as being the means of delivering that. Yeah. I mean, we look a lot in, in some of the, the customer experience, customer journey mapping that we do. And we, we look at the different elements of the customer journey and, and try and maybe test through mystery shopping, the purchasing journey or the renewal journey. But I've never heard yet of somebody saying, right, let's go and mystery shop on the complaint process. And I think that's a really pivotal point in the um, in the customer journey, say how effectively and how efficiently do you fix the problem that's, that's been caused? So I think a, a lot of focus on mystery shopping and experiencing your customer's experience when a complaint happens is an important point. I, I think that, I think, mm. you know, for me, a, a great example is, um, you know, I, I've worked for a number of retailers. Um, and if you buy from your own retailer, how do you get it delivered? Do you get it delivered to home? No, you don't. You get it delivered to your desk, a central point in the building or something. And that means that you're missing, all your customers are missing out on the delivery experience. And, and as I'm sure most people have experienced some challenges with that, um, especially over the last 18 months, but actually probably much longer than that. Because it, it's, I think they've come on leaps and bounds. And I think the service that we now get there's been, there's been a lot of investment and, and delivery now is, is much better than it was. But actually, if your staff are not seeing what the customer sees, it's, it's quite difficult. You know, then you're only going to get the complaints from the customers and you're only going to get it when it goes wrong with somebody who you need to recruit, not somebody you've already recruited. Yeah, I think we've got one um, time for one last question, um, Alan. So I'm going to ask a question that was submitted in advance by Dan Gordon. Um, and I think it's, it's a good one because it kind of rounds off in terms of best practice. So what's your advice for best practice in defining an FCR metric so that we know the baseline from what we want to improve on? I, I think what you need to do is you need to, you need to segment your complaint. You need to categorize your complaints, segment them, and then work out which ones you can resolve. Yeah. And therefore you need to know what it is that you've, I mean, that, that's kind of bringing everything I've said together because you need to know how much you've empowered the, the advisor to, uh, to resolve problems. You need to know that it, you, you can only measure first call resolution against those that you can resolve. So I would take everything out that is too difficult to resolve within a short period of time because there's, there's a time that you want to hold the customer on the, if, if it's on the phone, you can't hold them there for an hour while you go and find something. And therefore, you cannot resolve that first time. You need to go back. And therefore, I think it might not be first call resolution. It might be the time scale that you resolve it. Yeah. Because I think that's important. And again, the FCA, you know, they've got three days. So if you, if, you've got, if you can resolve a complaint in three days, you segment that from the ones that take longer and you've got less reporting requirements for it because it's, it's, it's done quickly. Yeah. That's probably a better measure. Um, I don't like to come away from... So if you can resolve it in one go, you should because that's the best experience for the customer. But don't beat yourself up if you can't because if you can't do it, there's no point measuring that. There's no point saying I'm failing my FCR because the complaints are too difficult. Yeah. You need to measure, it needs to be what you can achieve. So measure against what you can achieve and how successful are you in, in dealing with the ones that could be dealt with in one go. And then look at the next stage of how many can you, how many can you resolve within a period? So I would, I would probably look at it two, two dimensionally. One is, the number of calls it takes and the other is the time it takes and, and acknowledge the fact that you can't do everything in one go because if you try and do that you'll finish up upsetting yeah. the customer even more and you set yourself up to fail as you said so. yeah absolutely brilliant so we have come pretty much to the uh the top of the hour for uh, today's session and it's been really really insightful hearing what's happening in the in the regulatory space what's happening with FOS and how we can apply that to some of the non-regulated industries and sectors and i think both of you have, have contributed some real great points and some real good value and i've taken a lot away from there in terms of communication empowerment categorization 
root cause and fix what you can fix and mm. decide what you're going to do with the rest of it. Um, cause I think we, again, we can tie ourselves up in knots trying to fix things that maybe are, are insurmountable. We've just got to try and go through the best possible process that we can whilst we, uh, whilst we have those challenges that we can't necessarily fix there and there. Um, so it's been really great having you, having you both on board. Uh, thanks everybody who's asked a question and, uh, and been able to participate there. And I, what's left for me to say is, um, thank you all for, for attending. We've got another event that we're doing before Christmas, which is um, how to build employee engagement in a remote hybrid world. So we've got the CEO of um, Sensei, who's the, the outsourcer joining for us on the 25th of uh, November for that one. And then we take a break for Christmas and then we're back with the uh, the Q1, uh, Q1 curriculum, Q1 agenda or whichever it is that we want to call it. Um, but thank you all very much for uh, joining. Thanks, Caroline, for um, for coming along. Thanks, Alan, uh, for uh, for speaking as well. And take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Lovely to Bye. meet you. See you on the next one. Bye. Bye. -bye.